Hello, and welcome to another episode of Feeding His Sheep. Today we're in Mark chapter 2, and we're going to cover verses 13 through 20. Have you ever stood in line at a store long enough, and you probably glance around at the headlines on the magazines and the tabloids because there's nothing else to do? Well, no matter when you looked at them or which ones you read, I can almost guess what it was. Bad news scandals. It seems as if that's the only thing the media is interested in covering. If a story isn't some juicy gossip about somebody and or has something bad to say, it isn't considered newsworthy by the major outlets. And to be honest, I wonder how many people actually care about that stuff. I mean, who cares if the royal gardener spit his bubblegum on the sidewalk? Who cares if some person that I have never met and never will meet what they did in 35 years ago in high school? I've seen a post on Facebook the other day that says, everything I know about the Kardashians, I learned against my will. I agree. You know, report something positive about somebody for a change. With that being said, we who name the name of Christ, we who call ourselves Christians, we need to remember that the eyes of the world are always upon us. My grandmother once told me, you are the only Bible that some people will ever read. You know, skeptics and those antagonistic to our faith, they're watching out the corner of their eyes. They're waiting for a believer to mess up just so they can point their finger at you and say, aha, well, you know, breaking news. Christians aren't perfect either. We mess up. And when it happens, and it will, and someone calls your faith into question, admit it. Don't rationalize. Don't try to cover it up. Don't make all kinds of excuses. Just tell them, you know what? You're right. I shouldn't have done what I did. I shouldn't have said that. You know, and that immediately takes away all their ammunition. They came expecting a fight, not an agreement. In Proverbs 15, uh, verse 1, it says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And that's the way the Pharisees were when it came to Jesus. From day one, they were on his case. Every move he made, every word that he spoke, they scrutinized it and went over it with a fine-tooth comb, just trying to find ways to use everything against him. And we're going to see in the coming weeks in Mark that they're going to try to accuse him of Sabbath violations while they themselves are violating their own Sabbath restrictions in the process of following him and complaining. But in the verses we cover today, we're going to see Jesus having dinner and associating with people that they do not approve of. They are people who were created by him, people whom he would die for one day to redeem, people who ended up repenting and following him in obedience, but to the Pharisees, they were not worthy. So the only thing they could find in today's passage to hold against Jesus was the scandal of him showing grace to people who came to him looking for just that grace and forgiveness. That's the worst that they could do to him. They started calling him the friend of sinners. What Jesus really did was welcome repentant sinners and reject the self-righteous Pharisees who were unrepentant. That's the difference. That's the key word. The Pharisees were experts of the law that was given by God. But the problem was they strayed so far from the heart of God. They knew the law to the letter, but they did not know God's heart. Because not only did they missed the miraculous signs and the wonders. Not only did they miss all this evidence that Jesus clearly was their long-awaited Messiah, they also missed the point. They missed grace. The whole point of the law was to show us what a holy God expected of us and to show us that we could never possibly fulfill it perfectly. It showed us that we need a Savior. We needed mercy. We need grace, but they were still clinging to the old. Everything was changing right in front of them with the arrival of this Jesus, and they didn't like it one bit. They would have been perfectly content if everybody but them went to hell for eternity. You know, that's the whole reason Jesus went to the cross, so that it didn't have to be that way. Romans chapter 5 verse 8, But God demonstrates his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It didn't say after we reach perfection, Christ died for us. No. It didn't say when we got as good as the Pharisees, we would be accepted and he would die for us. No. While we were yet sinners. And our study today is going to show Jesus being associated with just that type, the sinner. But never forget that we too are also that type. You and I both qualify. We're the sinner type. So let us jump right into the text as Jesus calls another disciple to follow him, a man who would be the last person they would ever expect the Messiah to choose. 
a tax collector. Oh, no. Let's go ahead and begin with verses 13 and 14. And he went out again by the seashore, and all the people were coming to him, and he was teaching them. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. You know what I think's funny? Every generation that's lived under any form of government has always hated the tax man. We understand that taxes make the government function. You know, we need them for schools, roads, public welfare, military protection. We expect government assistance in the form of disaster relief. And, you know, the list is endless. But, oh, how we hate paying the taxes. But the man responsible for collecting said taxes is always the object of scorn. In my country, this would be the IRS agents, the internal Revenue Service. They receive the scorn of the people. Jokes are made about them. Nobody sends the IRS man Christmas cards. We just don't like them. And they're just doing a job that somebody has to do. But the tax collectors in Bible times in Israel were something else. The taxes we're talking about here were not Israeli national taxes. These were taxes paid to Rome. Essentially, it's a bully taking someone's lunch money. Never mind that that Rome has put up roads in between the towns in Israel, and some of them still exist today, and some of them are in better shape than our own roads. Never mind that Herod was dumping a considerable amount of Roman money into remodeling God's temple in Jerusalem. All they saw was their money going to a foreign nation who suppressed them. You know, it's all in how you look at it. Israel at that time under Roman oppression never had to go to war against an outside enemy under Roman jurisdiction. They never had to worry about the Philistines. They never had to worry about any other nation or country around them. And they were still allowed to live their lives, unlike the time they spent in slavery in Egypt. Now, unlike their time in Assyria and in Babylon, they they were still allowed to worship their own God in his temple, which Rome was spending money on. So it may not have been the ideal situation, but if you're honest, the nation of Israel had had it worse at other times. There are many countries today in which people cannot worship God because of their own government restricting them, much less another nation's mandates. So Israel hated paying taxes to Rome. But what really got under their skin, what really bothered them, was when one of their own countrymen worked for Rome, collecting those taxes. Those were considered the traitors, their scum. They're lower than the low. Now, let me explain quickly how the system of tax collecting worked. In this time before there were social security numbers for tracking people and computer databases to keep information on everybody. Rome had a lot of territory with a lot of people scattered everywhere. It would be impossible for an emperor or any ruler to keep up with. So their territory was divided up into regions. I assume it was divided either by geographical boundaries or probably by population density within areas. In the United States, we would say it was county by county, or some states have parishes instead of counties. And Rome didn't just choose a collector. That job was auctioned off to the highest bidder. They had no idea how many people or how much money was required to be collected from every person in a certain area. So they would set a price quota for every region. A potential tax collector would put in a bid of so much money for a certain area he would bid on it. He would spend his own money trying to buy the right to collect taxes in that area, kind of like a franchise agreement. If he won the bid for that area, he would pay Rome the amount of money that they they deemed appropriate, and then Rome was finished with the collecting. They took it from the collector himself, and Rome was done with it. Whatever he did was his own business. Then the collector would set up his booth and begin to collect from the people. He would recover his initial investment and then a little bit of profit. Now, that's understandable. He has to feed his family somehow. Every business has to have a markup on their product, whether it's 10%, 20 30 40 That's understandable. But the problem was when greed got into men's hearts. More often than not, these collectors would really line their pockets at the expense of the people. They would take way more than what was needed, and oftentimes they would become wealthy at the expense of their own countrymen. But again, it's all in how you look at things. It's your perspective. Yes, these tax collectors work for the enemy nation. Yes, they're being greedy and collecting more than what was necessary. But 
Somebody has to do this collecting. Do you really think things would be a lot better for your people if, you know, none of your people accepted the job? What about if Rome just installed some cold-hearted soldier in there to fill the role? Somebody who cared nothing at all about the plight of your people. That doesn't sound the least bit promising, but oh, how they despise the tax collector. One historian says that the Talmud and the Mishnah lumped the tax collector alongside with thieves and murderers. If a tax collector was to touch your house or walk into your house, it would be rendered ceremonially unclean. Now, since these Pharisees and rulers are so adept at adding their own made-up rules and applying them as if they're God's law, they even made up commandments about the tax collectors. They made it so that the Jews could lie to a tax collector without being guilty of sin. Now, I can see how this would help the people, you know, but God called lying a sin. Satan is called the father of lies, the father of deception. Lies are the property of the devil, not God's people. But these religious leaders not only thought that they were righteous, but they were technically placing themselves in God's position when it came to writing laws. They thought that their laws carried the same weight and the same authority as God's laws. So here is Matthew. We're introduced to him. His birth name was Levi. He was a Jew. He had dual names, just like Paul was also called Saul, just like Mark, whose gospel we're studying, is also called John Mark. It's probably wise to change your name, though, if you're a tax collector. You could have a little bit of cover to hide in or protect your family, because I said they were despised. They were not liked by anybody, and it wouldn't be surprising if oftentimes they had threats upon their family. Now, Matthew must have lived in that area in Capernaum. His job demanded that he should know everybody and know everything about everybody. Everybody. So there's no doubt that Matthew has heard about Jesus. He knows who Jesus is. He has heard his teachings. He has heard of the miracles that was done in his own hometown there in Capernaum. He has heard about the demons being driven out of the synagogue. He heard about the healing of Simon Peter's mother-in-law. All the demon-possessed people, all the people that needed healings that just piled into the house to where he eventually had to get out of town. He had heard about the healing of the paralytic that was lowered down through the ceiling when he came back to town and all of these other things. And somewhere in the middle of all of this, Matthew's heart changed. Here he was sitting in a lofty job that would have made him and his family very wealthy. He was sitting in a booth all day in the shade while others were straining under the hot sun, whether it be on fishing ships, out herding sheep and cattle or whatever it might be. He has this lofty job, lots of money, nothing to worry about, and he's no longer happy with where he's at. Something's missing. Matthew is desiring in his heart to get right with God, to get closer to God, to serve him. But would God want old Matthew? I mean, he's a tax collector. After all that he's done, you know, would would God still want him? Then Jesus came by and he looked over at him, seen him sitting in his booth there. And what he said and what he did shocked not only the Pharisees who despised the tax collectors, but I bet it shocked Matthew as well. He said to the young man, follow me. And he did. And he just abandoned that booth without hesitation. You know, we saw earlier in our studies that James and John and Peter and Andrew, they abandoned their fishing business to follow Jesus. And we thought that was radical. But you know, they could have gone back to and picked that up at any time because they'd left their father behind, James and John did, with their hired hands. The fishing business went on with or without these boys. So they could have gone back to it. In fact, they did. After the crucifixion, they seemed to forget that Christ said he was going to rise on the third day. So before they saw the resurrected Christ, they were stunned. They were in a daze. They didn't know what to do. So they did what they knew how to do. They went back to fishing. You know, they had given it up, but they were able to go right back. But for Matthew, there's no going back to this tax booth. As despicable as tax collectors were, this was a coveted position. But, you know, Rome, they had already had their money out of Matthew. So Rome was satisfied. They didn't care. He could have just quit and not collected a single shekel from a person there, and Rome would be satisfied. They've got their money. Now, had he already made his investment back yet? We don't know. But Matthew didn't care. In an instant, 
He gave up his livelihood on this earth. He gave up everything to follow Jesus. So I see a conversion here that's even more radical than that of the gentlemen who were fishermen. That makes sense when you consider all that Matthew has done. Later on, when a very sinful woman anoints the feet of Jesus with expensive perfume, Jesus said this in Luke 7:47. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven given little, loves little. Let me tell you, to walk away from what he did the way he did, Matthew loved a lot. He would prove to be a valuable asset to the ministry. The very people who despised him as a tax collector will be the ones that he will center his ministry around. Everything in Matthew's account of the gospel was written for a Jewish audience. He packed it so full of prophecies that they knew so well, and he showed how Jesus fulfilled each and every one of them. So Matthew was a valuable addition. They all worked. Each one had a distinct function and ministry, but that's another Bible study for another time. Let's go ahead and look at verse 15 of Mark chapter 2. And it happened that he was reclining at the table in his house, and many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many of them, and they were following him. This verse takes us to a scene that I believe is in Matthew's house. Matthew was a high-profile resident in Capernaum. Like I said, he knew everybody. Though most of the normal citizens, your average Joe down the street and his neighbors across the road, they didn't care for Matthew at all. Now, a smart tax collector likely surrounded himself with some thugs, with some rough people, to put it plainly, because you're going to need protection. You know, I'm sure Roman wouldn't have a guard to constantly dispense to sit by his tax collecting booth every single day of the year. No, I mean, so he had to have some rough friends. Maybe he would cut them a deal on their taxes if they would protect him from being beat up by people. You're going to need some friends that are going to track down tax evaders. It was on the honor system. Remember, he would sit there and they would come to him at his booth. So you would need someone to track down the people that haven't showed up yet. You're going to need help enforcing payment at times. If somebody was unable to pay something, you might have to possess some property of theirs and such. So you would be wise if you're a tax collector to surround yourself with some rough and rowdy friends. Sinners, as the text plainly labeled them there. So Matthew is filled with gratitude for his new calling in life. And from what I see here, he's holding a big feast. He calls all of his old rowdy buddies over to tell them this great news. And it's safe to assume that each one of these men were also used to being hated and shunned by society and the religious establishment. Probably most of Matthew's friends were not allowed to enter a synagogue. They were probably no, no allowed nowhere near the temple. But here they were with Jesus in this house, and they were accepted just as they were without one plea. And I believe that a great number of them were probably changed by their visit with Jesus. Hearts were being changed. People were repenting. God was at work. These outcasts were being saved and being converted. And that wasn't sitting very well with the establishment. The Pharisees never got those kind of results. So let's see what happens in verses 16 and 17. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, Why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? And hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Here we see the scribes of the Pharisees, and they had the same attitude as their bosses, the Pharisees. So why is he eating with tax collectors and sinners? As if they are not sinners themselves. You know, Romans 3.23 has yet to be written that says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Brothers and sisters, the sooner you and I get this through our thick skulls, the better. The Pharisees never did. They thought they were blameless. You know, just one sin makes you a sinner. Just one sin separates you from God for eternity. Just one sin caused death and suffering to enter a world in the Garden of Eden that was created perfect. You might say, well, I've never committed adultery. 
Jesus said that if you've ever looked at another person lustfully, you've committed adultery in your heart already. And that was proven when David looked at his rooftop at Bathsheba, who was bathing. And lust had sat in, and the next thing you know, he's in an affair and committing murder to cover it up and all kinds of things. But it began in his heart. You might say, well, I've never murdered anybody. Have you ever been angry at somebody before? If you've never been angry at somebody before, obviously you've never driven through a four-way intersection or you haven't done your Christmas shopping yet. Jesus said, if you've ever been angry at someone, you've already committed murder in your heart. You say, well, how is that different? I mean, you know, how is that the same as murder? How is being angry considered murder? Way back when Cain's offering was rejected and Abel's was accepted, God told Cain, said, why is your countenance downfallen? Why are you angry? said, sin is crouching at your door of your heart and it's wanting to master you, but you must master it. Well, Cain didn't. He didn't deal with his anger. And what did it lead to? murder. Every one of these big sins don't just happen immediately. Nobody goes out or hopefully goes out looking to commit adultery. Nobody goes out looking to commit murder without premeditation, without something going on in their heart that leads them up to doing something that. You know, I hear a lot of people all the time saying, I hate thieves, as if they've never stolen anything. I mean, have you seriously never taken anything, anything at all? A paper clip? an ink pen, a piece of candy? Have you ever taken credit for something that you didn't do when somebody come out and said, good job, and you boasted up, but you're not the one that done the work? Have you ever shorted God in your offering? You know, all of this stuff technically qualifies. You might say that's nitpicking and everything, but hold on. You might think that you're righteous on your own, but here in these last three minutes, we've discovered that every one of us is thieving, murderous adulterers, and we're just getting started here. Like I said, that might seem like nitpicking, but if what it, that's what adherence to the law required. If you're depending upon the law to be saved, you cannot be guilty of any of the least of these things, and it was a burden. The Pharisees added hundreds of their own restrictions on top of this, making the burden practically impossible. As far as the Sabbath, they had it where you couldn't even drag your chair across the floor to, to make room or anything to sit down because that chair might create a trough in the floor, and that's plowing. And we're going to see in a future verse that some of the disciples of Jesus would grab heads of grain and just rub it through in their hands to open it, and they would eat it. And, oh, that was considered threshing, and it was considered harvesting, and it was considered, you know, working the fields. It's no different than opening up a sunflower seed to get to the kernel in it. I mean, the way they had it, you couldn't make a fire on the Sabbath day, so all your cooking had to be done before. Well, if you've started a car on the Sabbath day, you created a fire inside your internal combustion engine. If you turned on a light switch, that switch made a spark inside there. All of these things are just the, the hundreds and hundreds of laws that they put on top of God's law. God's law, as far as the Sabbath, said simply, do not work. Do not do any regular work. It was in remembrance of the day that God had set aside and he had rested. And we'll get into this further in further messages where Jesus says that he is Lord of the Sabbath. And he says the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. But they had added all of these other restrictions to it, and the burden was impossible. The Sabbath went from a day of resting and a day to inflict upon yourself and a day to spend with the Lord into this incredible burden where you had to count your steps and not do anything, and it just was not joyful at all. But this message that Jesus was given to the people showed us a better way. In Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, this message was heartily welcomed by those who could not match up to the Pharisees' expectations. You know, the Pharisees considered themselves righteous. But here, Jesus just said, I didn't come to save the righteous. Now, he wasn't acknowledging that they had attained some degree of righteousness. No, the, the Pharisees were flawed. The, the Pharisees had sinned. In their minds, and only in their minds, were they righteous. In fact, they were at this very moment waiting to trap Jesus. 
purpose so that they could have him killed. Murder and premeditation or planning a murder is not the fruit of a righteous person. In fact, it's almost ironic how all of these repentant sinners who were being judged by the Pharisees and the scribes made it into heaven, and they did not. Their own righteousness, as impressive as it was, fell short. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, it says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. In that verse right there, Jesus acknowledged that in fact the Pharisees were more disciplined than the average person. But that wasn't enough. You cannot earn salvation through the law. It is impossible. You need a Savior. You need a Messiah. You need grace. You need Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. And that is the gospel in a nutshell. Everyone has sinned. Sin separates us from God. And Jesus is building a bridge for sinners to be forgiven, to make it able for us to draw near to God. He ultimately paid the price for our sins, satisfying God's wrath and purchasing our salvation. You know, it's been said that the road to the cross is on level ground. Whether you are a tax collector or a Pharisee, you need to come to Jesus with repentance and faith to be saved. Whether you are male or female, whether you are Jew or Gentile, whether you are Republican or Democrat, whether you're a lifelong church member or a lifelong drunk or drug addict, we all come to God the same way. Just because someone sins differently than you do does not make them a worse person and does not make you a better one. But the Pharisees could not grasp that concept. They could not wrap their mind around the concept of a man who claims to be the Son of God and he's associating and eating with these sinners. Now, to be fair, there's a bit of merit in the way that the Pharisees were thinking here, and by not associating with the wicked crowd. Generally, that is a good idea. The very first psalm, Psalm 1-1, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. You know, I hear people say all of the time that you're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. But you still have to be careful to draw a line somewhere. Notice, Jesus was eating with the sinners and he preached to them. Jesus did not sin with them. You may justify your going into places where a Christian shouldn't be by saying, how else will they ever hear the gospel unless I meet them where they are? Okay, examine yourself in that situation if this pertains to you. Are you sinning with them? Jesus didn't do that, ever. Are you preaching the gospel to them? Jesus did do that. Every time. The Pharisees didn't see this, though. They just saw Jesus sitting in with that crowd, and they automatically assumed that he was unclean just for being there. Let's go ahead and look at verses 18 through 20. John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and they came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, While the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot fast, can they? So long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and they will fast in that day. Note another group that's alongside the Pharisees here as well. John's disciples, meaning disciples of John the Baptist. I've always said before, when you study one gospel, you've got to take that account, that story, in with all of the other ones in comparison. Now, we've gone quite a bit back and forth between Mark and Luke, but this time, look over at Matthew's version of this. Matthew just mentions that it's just the disciples of John the Baptist. He doesn't mention the disciples of the Pharisees or the Pharisees being there. So these disciples of John the Baptist play an important role in this scene here. Now, you would assume that everyone who was baptized in repentance by John the Baptist was automatically a believer in the Messiah, right? Well, no, that wasn't always the case. Not every person he baptized was there those two days when John declared that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
Not every person was there when Jesus was baptized and heaven was ripped open and God spoke audibly for all to hear. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. For over six months after Jesus began his ministry, John continued baptizing. John told the people, though, that Jesus must increase and John must decrease. But not everyone was convinced that Jesus was the one that John was talking about. Jesus wasn't fulfilling the expectations of the Messiah that some people had imagined in their minds. He wasn't overthrowing Rome. And could you call this an army he's assembling? You have four fishermen and a tax collector. That's not much of an army. How are you going to overthrow Rome? How are you going to set up an earthly kingdom, you know? And here he was performing miracles and signs and wonders. But at the same time, he was also unconventional. He showed contempt for the religious leaders and their man-made Sabbath laws. He touched lepers. He claimed to have the authority to forgive sins, and he associated with an extremely vile members of society. He was mingling with outcasts and tax collectors. So these people, disciples of John, they stood unconvinced, or at the very least, they were curious anyway. They were ready to receive the Messiah. I mean, they've repented. They baptized in faith. They were made ready for the kingdom of God to come and be set up. But they looked differently at things than they, things looked differently than they imagined that they would. Here, they struggled with the fact that neither Jesus nor his disciples observed a regular period of fasting. So they go to the Pharisees who eagerly took them up on their doubts. Don't you imagine the Pharisees were all the more ready to have these disciples of John the Baptist join their side? Well, yeah, guys, you've got a point there. Why don't you go ask Jesus that yourself? He hates us. He only speaks to us in riddles and gets all mad when we get there. You go ask him. So these disciples of John did. They said, why don't your people ever fast? You know, they're still hung up on the traditions of Judaism. They just cannot do away with the old and let in the new. Do you realize that for the most of their fasting observances were just man-made tradition? There is only one place in Scripture where fasting was commanded. That's right, one place in Leviticus 16, Yom Kippur, the Day of, Aton- a day of Atonement, a once-a-year fast observed during a very solemn day, but that's it. But the Pharisees had made this a regular observance. They fasted twice a week. We have given the example of the Pharisee and the tax collector praying. And the Pharisee said, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like this man, this tax collector, for I fast twice a week and I tithe all of this. Well, John MacArthur stated in his studies that they fasted every Monday and every Thursday. I don't know what the significance of those days are, but that's what they had done. And oh, did these Pharisees make a spectacle out of it, too. They went around with these sour expressions on their faces. You know, I'm so hungry, I'm starving. They wore this sackcloth. They just moped around like a teenager being drugged to church on Sunday morning. They were just so miserable, but they wanted to appear so righteous is why they done that. And you know, everything the Pharisees did, they did it publicly for attention. Whenever they would pray, they would pray these elaborate prayers standing on the street corner. Jesus told us when we pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray for the praise of men, for they have gotten their reward. But he told us to go into our closet and pray to our Father in secret. When it come to giving alms, they would love to pat themselves on the back and give publicly and boast loudly while they're doing. I see a lot of people today do these things. I'm thankful for those that help people in need, but don't post a selfie of you helping some guy on social media. All that's doing is embarrassing him and bragging about yourself. Do your good deeds in secret and where God can reward you. Otherwise, if you're looking for the praise of men, that's all the reward you're going to get. Now back to this fasting. You can voluntarily fast. If you wish to express to God your seriousness about a certain prayer request that you have or something of some sort or just personal devotion, you can voluntarily fast. It isn't commanded. It isn't required, but you can do it if you wish to. Just don't do it like the Pharisees who did it for attention. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18, Jesus said, Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full." 
But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. There is a time, a place, and a way to fast properly, but it is not commanded for you to do so. You know, the disciples of John and these Pharisees, they've been so wrapped up in tradition, they have blurred the lines between God's law and man's. They could no longer tell where one left and the other began. They no longer could make the distinction between tradition and commandments. To the Pharisees, their traditions were law. You know, fasting is often associated with mourning for those who do observe it. And Jesus said this wasn't a time for mourning. That's what he told them in these verses here. This was a time for feasting. He was with them right now. The time would come when he would be taken away and crucified. But right now, he was there and they were feasting. They put an E in that fasting. Now, you know, the rabbis had actually made a law concerning feast during weddings. They'd actually made it a law, so to speak, that there should be no fasting at a time when there should be feasting. So Jewish tradition actually banned fasting during weddings. Whenever the host of a wedding would put out this elaborate food display, it would be considered an insult and possibly even a sin by their standards if you were to say, no, I I can't possibly partake in any of this. I'm fasting. No, you're supposed to rejoice with those who are rejoicing. By the way, do you notice this is the first reference to the marriage relationship between followers of Jesus and himself? This was a wedding feast. He had referred to himself as the bridegroom. The wedding feast would last for weeks, depending on the wealth of the one that's hosting the ceremony. You know, after an engagement or a betrothal was declared, the groom would often go away and prepare a home for his bride and his future family. Oftentimes, that home wouldn't be a separate building, but it would be an addition of a couple rooms adding on to the existing house of the groom's parents. Now, after it was completed and a certain amount of time had passed, the groom would return to an anxiously awaiting crowd. The arrival of the groom was much anticipated by everybody, and he would scoop up his bride and go to their new home and live happily ever after. Allow me, if you will, to share a familiar passage of scripture with you that will probably sound entirely different to you in light of this new knowledge of the wedding traditions. In John chapter 14, the first three verses, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Folks, the church of Jesus Christ is the bride of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. We are currently in the waiting stage, waiting for him to return and to take us home. He has spent all of this time since his ascension preparing a glorious place for you and I that we may spend eternity in heaven where he is. We need to be watching. We need to be waiting. We need to remain faithful and obedient to him so that when he returns to scoop us up, he will find his bride pure. He will find his bride waiting. He will find his bride observing things and waiting for him and doing their best to pull people in to the ceremony. But some of you manly types out there, you may be thinking, well, I ain't no bride. There's no way. (laughs) Yes, you are. I am too. Suck it up. Hey, at least we don't have to wear dresses, right? Myself, I'm thrilled by the fact that Jesus loves me. I'm thrilled and happy that he's preparing a place where I may be with him forever and you should be too. Jesus said the time was coming when they would fast. The time came when he was crucified. In fact, if you look through most of the scriptures, you'll notice nobody was eating. Jesus always had to initiate them picking up food and eating again, if you think about it. When he walked with those people on the road to Amios, they didn't recognize him. You know, at first they walked along with him. He said, why are you so downcast? Oh, we, this Jesus of Nazareth, we thought that he was the Messiah. And then and just a few days ago, they crucified him and they, and they buried him and they just thought everything was over. 
At the end of their conversation, as he explained with them the law of the Moses and prophets and all of these things concerning the Messiah, he went into their house and the Bible says that he broke bread and gave thanks and then they recognized him. Maybe there was something in the way that he had prayed or something like that that they'd seen before that made them realize, hey, this is Jesus. You know, they didn't recognize him because they weren't expecting him to be there. They were expecting him to still be in the grave. But you notice he is the one that broke the bread, the guest. That tells me that the guest is the one that either got the bread prepared or pulled it out or did something and broke it, but they weren't eating. So the guest broke the bread. When he appeared in the upper room to the 11, it was Jesus who asked them if they had anything to eat. I'd always thought, well, yeah, he'd been three days, you know, without anything to eat. He was hungry. And when he ate the fish in front of the disciples, it showed to them because they thought he was a ghost. Well, if he was a ghost, that fish would have went right through and flopped onto the floor. No, Jesus had a glorified, real, resurrected body. But food wasn't spread out. He had to ask, is there anything to eat here? They were distraught. They were not eating. The time for passing, uh, fasting, though, has passed. He has risen, and he is coming again. Our time should now be spent getting ready for his return, inviting as many people who will come to the ceremony so that they, too, may join us in heaven. Now, we don't know when that day will be. Don't worry about working out all these mathematical figures, trying to figure out what day the return of the Lord's going to happen. There's people that's tried that over the years, and they've ended up with egg on their face looking silly. Jesus said that you do not know the day or the hour. Even the Son didn't know, but the Father. You know, we don't know when it's going to be, but we are not on the planning committee. We are on the welcoming committee. So be ready. Be watching. At any moment now, our Lord will be returning. And then he will finally set up the kingdom that they assumed he was going to set up the first time around. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you're going to be there with him in that kingdom. It doesn't matter if it's seven years from now or 7,000 years from now. You will be there in a glorified, resurrected body worshiping Jesus. So praise God for him, for his son. Praise God for his grace that he has given to sinners such as you and I.